Hello there, one and all, and welcome to episode 444 of Love at First Scent with me, Persilaise, live on YouTube. As always, thank you very much for tuning in, whether you are watching live or you are watching the recording. But regardless of how you've tuned in, you have joined us for one of our top 10 lists, and not just any top 10, but a seasonal top 10, because I turned around the other day and thought, gosh, we are nearly at the third week of March, which means that the equinox is on its way. I had a quick look before we went live. And this year, it's actually going to be in the small hours, at least in the UK, of the, 20, the, the 20th of March, as opposed to the 21st. I suppose that's because it's a leap year. So I think if the internet is to be believed, um, spring um, astronomically, maybe if not meteorologically, starts at around 3 a.m. on Wednesday morning. So it means we need to get our spring list done. But I see that there is already a very, very um, animated conversation going on, sparked off by Rachel, even though Rachel's wasn't the first comment. First comment went to Aria, who says, hello, hello to Aria. And Rachel then has got a very, very interesting, but dare I say it, upsetting discussion going, because Rachel says, hi, Mr. P, have you heard the rumours that Chanel is discontinuing the exclusive extras, the 15 mil bottles. Um, simple answer to your question, Rachel. No, I hadn't. This is the first I've heard of it. And then, of course, there are lots and lots of people commenting, saying, oh, my goodness, they can't do that. I'm certainly going to have a very, very quick look to see what I can find out. Um, maybe maybe what's going to happen is that they're going to go away in this form and come back in a different form. I mean, I can't, I cannot imagine a Chanel collection without extras, but maybe, actually, I shouldn't say maybe because it's just going to be pure speculation on my part. So let, let's just see what happens. Um, Aria says, it took me over 15 years to finally pull the trigger on an extra. I found I rarely wear them and the price is outrageous. But now that everything else is that expensive, they didn't seem as bad. Yes, I think I kind of feel the pain that is coming out in your comment, Aria. Bonjour from Paris, says Tom. Sent Genie is here as well. Paroli says, hello, everyone. Spaced Out says, I picked up Bel Respiro for 90 bucks yesterday, almost a full 75 mil bottle. Of course, the question is EDT or EDP. Um, and Yet Not Dead <laughs> says, my favorite by far spring perfume, Lise Mediterranée from Frederic Mal. Oh, interesting, interesting. Um, so a very, very warm welcome to all of you. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, please do consider doing so. And if you are going to subscribe, please click on the little bell so that you get notifications of new videos coming your way. If you would like to find out how you can support my work, you should be able to see a link to the coffee page, to my coffee page in the video description below. But we need to get going because we have got 10 perfumes to do, plus two special guests. You know how there are always a few sort of either outliers or unexpected little additions or quirky little extras. We have got two special guests. Uh, regular viewers will also know that um, I try to follow a, a kind of loose theme, a rough theme to, to, to help me kind of conceive the list, to help me put it together. And um, I had a very, very quick look. Last year for the spring list, I decided to, to focus on the idea, that the concept of rejuvenation in a very, very kind of broad and abstract way. Um, and for today, I think maybe maybe because of a, a few things that are happening in, in our family, which we don't need to get into now, but because I'm kind of focusing on a sense of healing and constantly sending good wishes uh, in, in in the direction of a particular somebody and thinking about the, the power of nature to restore itself and the power of nature to, to bring about healing and to cause healing, I thought, okay, well, perfume is very often actually about the power of nature. So that, that's been the guiding phrase for today, the power of nature. And um, I had a few little other parameters as well. I didn't want uh, this to then just be entirely floral just because it's spring although there are a lot of florals here because it's spring anybody dares to do a devil wears prada reference <laughs> don't even bother um but the other thing that i wanted to do is that i wanted to try to make sure in the kind of spirit of spring um i wanted to try to make sure that um oh gavin goes groundbreaking oh thank you so much very very good somebody had to do it right somebody had to do it um but you've made me lose my train of thought. No, I wanted to make sure that all of them are pretty new. Um, and I, 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 I wasn't sort of slavish about all of this, but now when I look at the list, 
I see that I have managed to actually make all of the selections on this list from this century. And, uh, uh, yeah, well, let's leave it at that, because I'll tell you what, what the years are. But a lot of them are even, you know, are, are very, very recent, apart from one of the special guests, which is a scent that is available at the moment, but is but but first came out um, a few decades ago. Um, gosh, lots and lots of uh, comments still about Chanel. Basil <clears throat> says, first time tuning in from Singapore. You're very welcome. Working a bit past midnight on a Sunday to empower a good old nine to six Monday tomorrow. I do that kind of thing as well, trying to tie up loose ends on a Sunday so that the Monday I feel like I can hit the ground running. Um, and <laughs> another groundbreaking florals <laughs> thing. Stop it now. We should we should start. Um, and obviously, you need to tell me what you think of the sense that I'm going to present to you. And you also please need to tell me what you are looking forward to wearing this spring. OK, so one, the one that I would like to start with is, is a kind of hot off the, the press, although there is one that is going to be even hotter off the press. This is something that I reviewed just a couple of weeks ago, I think, on this channel. I'm really, really taken with it. It's brand new from Guerlain. It is eye-wateringly expensive, but for today, let us not talk about price. It is from their L'Art et la Matière range, the latest one, narrowly plein sud, composed by uh, Delphine Jelk. Um, I've really, really been enjoying wearing this and getting to know it. Um, let's have a spray. And this, I think, um, sums up the theme that I would like to try to convey very well, because this has the power to completely oh, just sweep me away. Um, oh, Martin says this video is going to be helpful because here in Argentina, we're entering autumn. Oh yeah, of course. But lately, florals have been piquing my interest. Um, okay, well, I hope I hope you find some inspiration here. Um, Nerali Plansud is is not the first Nerali for Garla. Is also not the first Nerali in the La Ella Matière range. Um, but it's their first one that somehow mixes the structure and the concept of a very very traditional cologne. Um, with, uh, with with spices. So it's a kind of spicy, narrowly cologne with, with, with the narrowly acting as a bridge between the spicy elements, the, the, the cinnamon, the nutmeg, the cardamom, something gingery, and the, the facets that you would expect from a more traditional cologne, something herbal, something more citrusy, something much more translucent, much more open. Um, but to me, the first time I smelt it, I thought, gosh, this is this, this is a scent of movement. It is a scent of traveling. It is the scent of something that has the power to sweep you off your feet. Um, and if it is meant to evoke the South and moving to the South, which I guess it is, according to its name, I, I, I think it does that really, really well. It's one of those close your eyes and you're there type scents, which is one of the ways in which I interpreted um, the idea of, of power. The other thing that I was doing a little bit of reading the other day, and I thought, could this feed into the the list um, in some way? I, I came across this idea of the five spiritual qualities or five spiritual powers in Buddhism. And apparently they, they are faith, effort, mindfulness, concentration, which is defined as being something a bit different, and wisdom. And I kind of thought, okay, there are only five, and there are ten perfumes. But which of them would would um, would would which would would which <laughs> try that again? Which of them would each of the perfumes correspond with? And I suppose maybe narrowly plan suit is it, maybe it's mindfulness because it's it's even though it's about traveling, I think because it's about traveling, it grounds you in the moment because that's one of the joys of traveling. I think is that you cannot help but just give yourself up to it. And just by the virtue of the fact that you're doing that, you you give yourself up to the moment. Um, somebody is saying, Dushan, great choice. What is it? What is it? Opium secret de parfum. Which one is the secret de parfum? Because, ah, well, I'm, I better not say anything. I better not say anything. Um, Druba says, I think a carnation list would be interesting. It would lean very vintage. You are absolutely right. Anyway, we are off to a sweeping start with Garla. Next up on this top 10 list, let us go back just a few years 
to something from 2021. It's composed by Fabrice Pellegrin, as it turns out, uh, not the only Pellegrin sent on this list. That was not planned. I just kind of looked at them and I thought, oh gosh, yeah, I've got two Fabrices here. And this one um, geographically takes us to a different part of the world, even though it's not a kind of sweeping traveling scent in that way. Um, Oh, Gavin, oh, Gavin, you're on a roll today. There is nothing Buddhist about a bottle of perfume that costs near 300 pounds. You are right, but maybe there is something Buddhist about the smell of <laughs> that perfume. And maybe there is something Buddhist about how I am trying to connect to that small hook, that smell onto a sort of con a concept. I do not disagree with you, but I think if we get hung up on those sorts of things today, we're not gonna have a very fun list. Anyway, from 2021, from, uh, this is another expensive one, from Lila Noor, this is Gul Rouge. Uh, Gul, I guess, means either flower or 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 rose. Um, and let us have a spray. Um, Basil says, okay, Mr. P, you now have to tell us the other four scents that correspond to the other Buddhist powers. No, well, I thought as we're going along, we would try to, you know, you need to tell me which of the perfumes do you think, as we're going along, would either correspond with faith, effort, mindfulness, concentration, or wisdom. That was the idea. We'll just kind of keep going. Anyway, Gul Rouge from Lila Noor, a brand that um, is, is and I think, has yet to find an audience. I mean, okay, um, it, it, it's pretty new. They, they haven't had a chance to find much of an audience as yet. And I guess it's things aren't helped by the fact that um, they've gone for a kind of exclusive distribution type thing. So as far as I know, in the UK, are they still exclusive only to, to Harrods? Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, um, Rachel says the whole Lila Noor brand feels like spring summer to me. There, there you go. I'm glad you agree. So this is their Gull Rouge. It's, it's a really, really um, gorgeously done rose um but as i was re-smelling it i was trying to think okay is it is it simplistically rose or is it a simple rose in this and and obviously it is very di difficult it is much more difficult to do something that is pure and simple and effective rather than something that is merely simplistic and i think i lean more and more towards saying that it's pure and simple and streamlined and beautiful for all of that rather than simplistic um there is something to my nose convincingly Indian about it. Um, when I smell it, I'm taken back to, oh gosh, to my first trip to India, which is going back quite a few years now. And we went to, and I'm getting a weird, weird deja vu moment because I think I've told this story on this channel before. And I think when I first told this story, I forgot the name of the place that we visited. And then one of you helped me where is the place that you tend to visit if you're on the tourist track after you've gone to the Taj Mahal in Agra? Is it Fatehpur Sikri? This, somebody's going to tell me whether it's Fatehpur Sikri. Um, maybe this time I've remembered, whereas last time somebody had to, had to help me out. But anyway, where, wherever the, wherever it was, I'm looking at the comments to see if somebody says, um, oh, Druba says you're right. Okay, thank you very much for once I remembered. Um, and there were some people selling rose oils or what they they said were rose oils and there was one that was just really really kind of spicy and peppery and rosy as well and Gul Rouge from Lila Noor kind of heads in that direction it's it's not super spicy it's not sort of super eugenoly super carnation-y but it heads that way and I guess that's what takes it away from you know, I suppose a diptyque rose or or, or or something that is more definitely more overtly French or European. Um, and I think because it's restrained, um, that's what kind of makes it powerful. And of course, now you're going to say which of the five spiritual qualities. I'm not going to overthink this one, but I'm thinking maybe this one is faith because there's something very, very, very quietly powerful, quietly insistent about it, you know, like a kind of core of faith that that nothing can take away from you. Uh, Oris says, yes, faith. And, and Rachel thought faith as well. Well, I'm glad we're in agreement. Should we say we have a consensus of three? Um, 
Will 2024 see an Amouage top 10, says Lanoon. Um, who knows? Never say never, right? Um, Alcoholic Nun says, speaking of roses and India, I'm currently awaiting my bottle of Penhaligon's Vara in the mail. So beautiful. I nearly, nearly included Vara in this top 10. But I thought, no, let's try and set, kind of, you know, mix it up and do perfumes that we wouldn't normally talk about. And for number three, let's do the one that is um, in the thumbnail. So a lot of you, are, some of you are going to quickly go and see what the thumbnail is. The thumbnail shows you... Um, Chanel's uh, Belle Respiro, just to take the conversation back to Chanel. This is, uh, in case some of you are wondering, this is the EDP, the EDT, the beautiful, gorgeous, heavenly, one of my favorite scents of all time. The EDT came out in 2007, composed by Jacques Polge. But then there came a point when the brand did away with all of the exclusive EDTs and replaced them with EDPs. So for the sake of presenting you with things that are available out there, as opposed to things that you can't get anymore. We're going to smell the EDP, uh, still by Jacques Polge. Um, now, I've gone on record several times as saying that I think the EDT is better. Somebody just said, somebody says, is it Vukasin says, marzipan grass. That's interesting, almond de grass. And then Pradeep says, Bel Respiro, what a beauty. Or cut grass, says Dimitri. Um, I can't wait to wear Bel Respiro this spring. I am sure that I've included Bel Respiro on spring lists before. I may even have included it on last year's, but I didn't go back and look because I thought, no, let's not do that. Let's just kind of pretend we don't know anything. Um, <sighs> Spaced Out says, Bel Respiro has a tasteful ozonic marine quality to it. E Yes, I mean, it, it is tastefulness itself, isn't it? It's a very, very, very elegant scent. And if you want to go down the route of wearing something that is marine, outdoorsy, green, ozonic, then you really, really cannot do better than Bel Respiro because there is nothing kind of fake or artificial or unconvincing about it. I adore it. Lots of love for Bel Respiro. Mache says, I love this one. We'll spray some right now. KT says, I love Bel Respiro. Um, Vukasin says, I gave my 200 mil Bell Respiro EDT to my mother. It made me gag. Well, that's okay. Well, I hope your mum enjoyed it. <laughs> Love Bell Respiro in spring, says cheap imitation, nothing better. Um, I don't really get that much marine in Bell Respiro, says Thomas. No, I, I get green. I get green and maybe I would go so far as to say ozonic and rather than marine. I get more mineralic than marine. Um, it's it, 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 it's another one of those kind of sweeping you away type scents, like Narrowly Plasud. It, it's, uh, the description that I gave in, in, in my book right there is the one that I stand by. It feels like standing on the edge of a cliff somewhere in the Mediterranean, and you've got this um, beautiful, you know, beautifully kept lawn behind you with maybe some wildflowers growing somewhere. You can picture a Chanel mansion behind it if you like, but let's let's leave let's leave. Gabrielle out of it. Um, and then ahead of you, of course, is, is the beautiful sea with, with the sun sparkling on it. And it just captures that, that impression, captures that image. Um, KT says, the first thing I smell when I open the bottle is freesia. Okay, well, maybe that's, we're picking up on that kind of wild flowery thing together. Um, I wouldn't say no to that. But to me, it is, it is green and yet kind of cleanly musky, slightly earthy as well and crunchy somebody says somebody's used the word crunchy yeah absolutely ethan says hello from korea you're very welcome thank you for tuning in i'm a huge fan of your channel thank you for your recommendations as always that's very 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 sweet of you thank you very much uh, rachel says yes to mineralic and aria says chili chili iris yeah i wouldn't say no to that either this is why i love getting these kind of interactions with you because you do make me see the sense in different ways. And of course, Iris is meant to be the kind of running theme through all of the original exclusives, isn't it? Uh, Basil says, I was actually betting you would have chosen, uh, sorry, I was actually betting you would have chosen Cristal. Bel Respiro is great too. I need to smell, perhaps I'll be able to do it next weekend. I need to smell current Cristal, because of course it's meant to have been changed, hasn't it? And I'm really, really worried about what it might smell like because um, I, I, I love it. I do love, um, Style. Rachel says, Mr. P, do you have a hyacinth on the list? This flower is spring to me. Gosh, that is a good point because if it, it, it is spring and 
with my Iranian Persian heritage, I should have thought of that because hyacinths are the flowers that you put on the on the New Year spread, the the the, the no ruse spread. But I don't, I ain't going to be giving you a hyacinth today. I don't think. Are any of these kind of vaguely hyacinth? The, I don't think so. Sorry, sorry, but hopefully you'll like these. What's your favorite hyacinth, Rachel? Um, Omar says, Cristal is so good, but more civic than nature smelling. I agree. Alcoholic Nun says, Badusoa is the most photorealistic hyacinth to me. I adore it. Oh, I should revisit that. And we'll wait to see what Rachel says. Okay, so we've done. <laughs> Gavin. Oh. T.S. Eliot is disappointed, says Gavin. Okay, I thought I wouldn't have to do this, but let me do the April is the cruelest month. But breeding lilacs, breeding lilacs, okay? The hyacinth girl comes up later on, doesn't she? Oh, this is so... How, how can a poem just be so ingrained into you? Um, do I have lilacs? <clears throat> I have a lily. Maybe that will count. Anyway, Gavin, what is your, I'm, I'm curious, what is your profession? What do you do when you are not, you don't have to reveal any of this. What do you do when you're not watching YouTube videos? <clears throat> Let's moving on. Let's moving on. Let's move on. Uh, fourth on the list. Fourth on the list is a very, very recent um, addition to the collection. I was, I was gifted this very, very kindly, but it's a scent that we talked about when it came out. You actually very kindly enabled me to get another one of the scents in this collection. So to put you out of your misery, I will reveal that from 2022, this is uh, from L'Artisan Parfumo, composed by Con one, the one and only Quentin Biche. This is Musk Amarant. There you go. Do you remember this collection? The Potager collection, the sort of herb garden collection. Um, I, as many of you will know, absolutely fell in love with Iris de Gris. And then I think there was a video, it must have been like an end of year video or something. Suddenly the, the, the super chats all went crazy and you said that you were doing it so that I could treat myself to a bottle, which I did and which I absolutely adore. But this one made its way to me uh, not very, very long ago. And the, it's 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 a it's a garden inspired collection, right? Uh, so there is definitely um, conceptually lots and lots here about the power of nature. But this, I think, was my second favorite on the list, and I find this one fascinating as well because it's doing a beetroot thing, right? Oh, the comments have suddenly gone crazy. What are you all saying? Um, Shan says, "I hope I'm not too late." Of course, you're not too late. Uh, Yo, Joanna says, "Hello from Bucharest. I'm a programmer for a European insurance group." And other than that, it would be very boring to go into details. Okay, thank you very much. The, the question was aimed at Gavin, because I just want to know if Gavin is some kind of professor of English literature or something somewhere. But you can all tell me what you do. That's fine. I, I would I would very much be interested to find out. Alcoholic Nun says, I've been on a huge Lartisan kick lately. Uh, Rappel Toi is swoon-worthy. I adore Duchaufour's florals. Anyway, let's smell. The one that is called musk, even though actually it is a beetroot, um, Oh, Dimitri, how did he balance the Akigala wood to beetroot ratio? We have another Quentin coming up, actually. A Quentin that I dare say very few of you will have had a chance to smell yet because it is like like scorching off the press. Um, the I don't get a huge amount of Akigala wood here, but I get earthiness. I get woodiness. So maybe it is in there somewhere. Um, the other beetroot scent, or beetrootish scent, that I love, again, as you may know, is Comme de Garçons Rouge. And it's interesting doing a comparison of the two, because Rouge takes the kind of sharper elements of the beetroot and, to my nose, aligns them with, with incense, because Rouge actually becomes a very, very interesting kind of root vegetable incense-y scent. Uh, Comme des garçons, rouge is fantastic, says Dimitri. Thank you very much. I agree. Um, the Lartisan goes down, could I say, like maybe a more kind of acidic herbal root um, into earthiness. So it is it is somehow more naturalistic, more based in, in, in that garden, in growth, in the power of nature. Um, Musk Amaranth does have a somewhat of a classical feeling to my nose, says Aria, just smelling my sample. Yes, tell me what else you can pick up to it. Is it similar to Ensalade, says Dimitri? No. Is anything similar to Ensalade? I mean, is anything similar to Ganymede? Um, didn't Kyoto from Diptyque feature a beetroot note, says Air Bureau? 
somebody mentioned this in a, in the comment the other day. I don't remember smelling Kyoto. Oh, and I've just realized we haven't gone all Buddhist. So Bel Respiro from the Buddhist spiritual qualities would be what? To me, Bel Respiro is, is concentration, I think, as opposed to mindfulness. Because concentrate, I think the difference, mindfulness is being in the moment, right? Concentration is actually focusing on a specific thing. And I think with Bel Respiro, it's always just like, keeping your eyes on, on 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 the horizon and very much focusing on the horizon and thinking ahead, but being focused on thinking ahead, if you see what I mean. And the the Lartisan, let's say the Lartisan is 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 effort, um, because I think it is about going out there and getting your hands dirty in the garden and putting the blood, sweat and tears in, um, because you know the rewards are going to make all of that effort worthwhile. Uh, Shan is commenting on football. Is there a football match going on? Manchester United versus Liverpool game is intense. I'm struggling to pay attention to both. <laughs> oh, I love these. I love these lists. I love these seasonal lists. I always go away with a huge smile on my face. And Madame Persolet says, how did it go? And I said, well, I think it went well. I had a good time. Um, Kyoto is gorgeous, says Shan. Um, yeah, this one, this one, I'm I'm so so happy to, to to have this. I'm gonna I'm going to have to I'm going to um have to wear it more. Right, let's get to the halfway point because we are nearly at the half hour mark. And what did I decide would be number five? Oh well, we've talked about diptyque. Let us uh, let us show you this one. Uh, this is the this year's limited edition bottle of Doson, which was uh, featured on this channel not that long ago. Doson is uh, originally came out in an EDT form in 2005, and then in 2013, um, the brand released it as an EDP. And this is the second Fabrice Pellegrin composition. It's uh, a, a lot of people consider it to be an awful tuberose. Uh, a lot of people consider it to be their favorite tuberose. I think it's a really, really fascinating, valid, interesting way of doing a tuberose that is very, very fresh and light and outdoorsy and and green, obviously, by by virtue of the fact that it's sort of fresh and outdoorsy. Look at the colours there. Isn't that a, very, a lovely array of bottles? I like Doson, says Natasha. Thank you very much. So do I. Although it took me a while to get to Doson. Um, Yeah, I was having a conversation about tuberose just the other day with somebody and how, you know, when you do a tuberose, you basically have to make a decision as to which one of two forks in the road you're going to go down. You know, are you go to, are going to go down the kind of vampish, teeth bared, claws extended fracas mode? Or are you going to do something that is going to be more green, more about the sort of flowers in a garland, maybe more coconutty? Uh, in the vein of, let us say, carnal flower, although there is plenty of vamp in carnal flower as well, but you know what I mean. Doson is definitely in the let's keep things fresh, let's keep things light, let's keep things super naturalistic vein. And I, I think it does that extremely well. Um, Natasha says, not sure why they have a red patterned bottle, though. The last limited edition one was blue and seemed to suit better. Was it blue or was it kind of greenish? I can't remember. Um, I think the colour is meant to be cinnabar. And I guess that ties in with the sort of Vietnamese inspiration for the scent. Pradeep says, Carnal Flower is the only tuberose I have. Oh, I love tuberose criminelle as well from, from uh, Serge Lutens. Uh, Rachel says, Lodamiel makes a gorgeous green tuberose with the zoo called Tuberose Organique. I must check it out. Um, but I, th I think I think this is really, really great about the power of nature, the power of nature to be, to, to bring about, I was going to say to be tranquilizing, wrong, wrong verb, wrong gerund. Um, no, to, to bring about tranquility, to bring about serenity. Um, it's a very, very peaceful, very kind of zen tuberose, and that in itself makes it interesting. So shall we say that this one, shall we say that this one is maybe mindfulness as well? We haven't had wisdom yet. Oh, okay, I can see at least one which would be wisdom, maybe two, because we've had a faith, we've had an effort. Okay, we, we will have to, oh, and perhaps one of the special guests will be wisdom. I think definitely one of the special guests will be wisdom. Um, Alcoholic Nun says, <clears throat> I tend to prefer tuberoses 
more carnal, fleshy, creamy, and bubblegum facets versus the camphorous and green, but I do adore carnal flower. Um, and Basil says, vampish tuberose for me, I like to scare people away. That's fine. Um, yeah, dose on. And, and again, you know, not want to kind of want, wanting to be prescriptive in terms of gender, but I think uh, Doson is, is a tuberose that, that, a, that a guy could very, very easily pull off. OK, we have done five, which means that it is time for me to remind you that you're watching episode 444 of Love at First Scent with me, Persilase, live on YouTube. And we are doing our seasonal top 10 because spring is just around the corner. So these are top 10 perfumes for spring 2024, loosely inspired by the concept of the power of nature and all the different forms that that power can take. We are up to number six. Oh, uh, talk about power. Okay. And talk about vamps and talk about things being a little bit strange and a little bit unusual. This is from last year, from 2023, composed by Antoine Lee, very much under the creative direction of Barbara Herman. This is oh, Delta of Venus from Eris. Uh, one of my favorite perfumes of last year. Oh, great question. I want to know too, says Rachel. What was the question? Oh, Gavin's question. Does anyone know how Pierre Sims Horn OK, please, compares to Cedre by Serge. Well, I can very, very quickly answer and say that it didn't make me think of Cedre straight away, but what it does make me think of is Santal Blush from Tom Ford, if that helps. Uh, sort of floral, sandalwoody thing. Um, anyway, Delta of Venus from Eris. Ah, nice guava note. Rachel says, this one could be wisdom. It could. I'm not going to argue with that one. I'm not sure I would have put it as wisdom, but if you want to call it wisdom, we can do that. Um, is there a rainy scent in the mix, says Angeline? I'm going to say no, but maybe one that could evoke rain in a way. Let's see what you think. By the way, hello, Angeline. So, uh, Delta of Venus, really, really kind of curious, green, mandarini, citrus fruity, guava, shades of mango, kind of tart but also welcoming kind of drops of dew on green leaves, but also sort of colorful, bright oranges of mangoes and bright greens of guavas and, you know, maybe throw in some kind of dragon fruit color in there as well. It's really, really iridescent, really, really bright. Um, but also a little bit strange, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, uh, Sophia Groisman's old calyx for prescriptives on a bit of a funny acid trip without without coming across as overly synthetic because what Antoine Lee has done here so brilliantly is that he's made something that's kind of strange and yet natural smelling. Um, Paul Clinton says, does Delta Venus have an Anais Nin inspiration? Um, I believe it does. Watch the interview with um, Antoine and Barbara that they gave in here on this channel in January. She's one of my favorite writers, so I would be interested to try it. Her diaries are an amazing monument to egotism. Oh, good description. Uh, I think you should check out the perfume, regardless of whether you're interested in an Ayas Nin. Um, Aria says, Delta Venus is amazing in that it has mass appeal, but is also interesting enough to keep things exciting. Gotta hand it to Mr. Lee. Completely agree with you. Um, Basil says, I think the recent, oh, some of you are still talking about rain. I think the recent H24 flanker is supposed to have an after rain vibe too. Yes, it's supposed to, whether it does or not is, is I guess, open to interpretation, but I think it, it is supposed to. Delta Venus made me cry, says Oris, in a kind of emotional good way or in a sort of, oh my goodness, where is the future of perfumery going way? Um, yeah, I get, I get weird and yet totally compelling sweet greenness. Um, almost like somebody has presented me with a bowl of the freshest, juiciest, ripest, exotic fruit, um, but also kind of like put them on ice um, and presented them with, with dry ice as well. And it's, it's very dramatic. It's very dramatic, very, very interesting. Aria says, the Guava Vetiver record is inspirational. I can see it being recreated a lot in the coming decade. Ah, okay. Right, let us move on then. Next on the list. Next on the list is the one where I thought, could somebody maybe detect some 
raininess in here. But funnily enough, it's a scent that somebody mentioned right at the beginning of the broadcast as being their absolute favourite for spring. From 2000, from the year 2000, part of the original Frederick Mal lineup, composed by Edouard Fleschier, we have Lys Méditerranée, uh, Mediterranean Lily. Um, th this, this is beautiful. This, this really is one of the best sort of like um, exotic lily type scents ever. It is so photo real. I have just remembered, let that one settle. Oh, did we did we give a spiritual quality? I'm happy to go with wisdom. Let's go wisdom. I mean, I suppose personally, maybe I would have gone with, what would I have gone with? Maybe I would have gone with concentration for Delta, but I'm happy to go with wisdom. Um, what are people saying? Alcoholic none. This and Lily and Spice, discontinued Ben Halligan's, are the most photorealistic lily fragrances I've encountered, and I own dozens. My favourite note and flower. Um, oh, it's really, really special, isn't it? So beautifully done. I don't know why people don't talk about it more. I mean, clearly it's still around. It hasn't been discontinued or anything. Um, great pick. So salty and refreshing, says Yet Not Dead. It's it's kind of difficult to go beyond saying that it's a lily because you just keep thinking, oh my goodness, it's like it's like I've just been handed the most gorgeous bouquet of lilies, but it has that, let's try and break it down a bit. So it's definitely got greens in there, but it's got something kind of marine-like, salty, as somebody said in there as well. Maybe shades of something related to orange blossom and also definitely something sweet and vanillic, but not overly so. Gently, sugary, um, something earthy too, maybe there's a kind of patchouli note coming through as well. And yet, despite all of that, it also manages to be white. You know, is, is there some very, very, very clever use of aldehydes at the top? And I suspect also a very, very clever use of some sort of citrus note at the very top. Um, you know, maybe maybe a mandarin that's so large that, that you almost kind of get blind to it and you go straight into the florals. Um, I get a smokehouse note in it, says Rachel. Hmm, interesting. The lilies are a bit wilted to me, says Oris. Well, the, the, they're giving out their smell very, very powerfully, aren't they? They're not super, super fresh, but I guess that's what makes it interesting. Gavin says, Luca Turin says it has a ham note. And I don't get that, but then, you know, the hams vary as well, don't they? Um... Authentic lily accords, says Alcoholic Nun, deserve a, a resurgence. Most modern renditions read more tuberosy, solar, creamy, looking at you, least 41. You're right, actually. Yes, they do. They they maybe just overplay things and become a little bit too aggressive, angry, if that's the right way of putting it. But Lise captures it. I actually um, gave this bottle as a gift to Madame Persilaise a few years ago, hoping, 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 hoping that she would be able to get past the kind of greenness, but she is hypersensitive to green and she 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 couldn't take it. So it, it kind of very, very sadly came back into my collection. I loved it on her, but 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 she couldn't take it. Um, really, really beautiful. Okay, we have three to go on the main list before we do our special guest. And okay, so here is the brand new one. I think it is available to buy, although it may not actually be. And I got this sample just the other day and I smelt it and I thought, gosh, this is interesting. And then I thought, actually, this would work on the list. Uh, it is the other Quentin Biche. Um, it is from Maison Crivelli. This is their tuberose astral, one of their x-rays. So astral tuberose. Let's have another spray. Um, and the very first thing that um, I thought when I wore it the other day was, oh, so it's like tuberose leathery osmanthus. And sure enough, that is what they've gone for. Should we pop that on here? Does that work? I think maybe this would be wisdom, actually, because there is something astral about it. Um, what are people saying about it? Uh, oh, people guessing that it's tuberose astral. Got a few samples in Prague, says Dushan. Um, it is to die for. Okay, so you really, really like it. Right, let's have another spray. A smell, rather. 
yeah, it's it's a really strange tuberose. And and Contin has been Contin Biche has been on a, on a roll for a while, um, and he's done something quite interesting here because you would have thought that tuberose and osmanthus would be like major major overkill because of course osmanthus is a big player as well bringing those kind of peachy apricotty leather notes into the mix and yet it sort of works you get um <laughs> air bureau says crivelli biche and tuberose what could go wrong yeah you need to go crivelli biche tuberose osmanthus what could go wrong um but but somehow through the the kind of largeness through the proportions through the size um there's a really really interesting mix contrast between the the sort of gentleness of the florals and this really quite kind of butch bruce banner about to turn into the hulk type personality um so maybe that's why it's wisdom because it sort of encompasses everything um it whether it's astral is is a different story i mean i I guess what I'm saying kind of conveys a sort of astral feel, but it didn't make me, you know, it didn't make me kind of like shut my eyes and start picturing the Milky Way or anything like that. Um, Basil says, Crivelli is a house that always smells the opposite of what I expect from the name. Yes, I know what you mean. And I think that's why there are some that I definitely like more than others. I mean, I, I liked some of their early ones and then maybe not so much from what I suppose we can consider their middle period, and then some of the more recent ones I found interesting, like their Neroli Nisimba, their Patchouli Magnetic, also by Quentin Biche. Um, but this one, this one is curious. I think, I think just because it's weird, and again, this idea of tuberose and osmanthus coming together to create this odd clash ties in with the idea of the power of nature, which is why I included it on the list. Rachel says, "Is this one super musky?" Um, no. No, I, I wouldn't say so. If anything, the base is more woody rather than musky. Uh, Shan says, Hibiscus Mahajad is nauseating. Yeah, see, that one I couldn't take so much either. But I thought their Oud Stallion was a, was a well-done Oud. Their Oud Maracuya was a kind of interesting Oud with the sort of whole Oud passion flower thing. Um, do you get leather in this one? Yes, definitely. I mean, I, I sort of said the, leather, the leathery aspect of the Osmanthus for sure. Um, it is, it is interesting. It is interesting, and I'm happy to put it on this list. So, we have two to go from the proper list, and then the two special guests. Next up, number nine, then. Number nine is one that I actually had to go online to make sure that it is still available, and I was thinking, please, please, please let it still be available. Number nine was sparked off or was was sort of prompted by a, a conversation with Madame Perselaise, which, which actually also led to one of the special guests. I'll tell you what it is. From 2014, and I can't believe that that means it's 10 years old, it is the absolute version of Jour d'Hermès, from Hermès, composed by Jean-Claude Elena. A really, really underrated piece of work, Jour, I think. The original Jour came out in 2013. It was um, Eleanor's attempt, I think, to... Oh, Shan says, I am wearing it right now. <laughs> you must be the best smelling football spectator anywhere on the planet right at this second. Um, there you go. It was Jean-Claude Eleanor's attempt to do um, an abstract floral. And it, and it's very, very difficult to say the term abstract floral nowadays without almost automatically at the front of it adding the term old fashioned, because the whole idea of an abstract floral now feels um, a bit dated, which is a real shame. And I think I think something needs to be done about that. But Jour was his attempt to do a sort of, you know, you're walking into a flower shop and you smell all these flowers at, at once. And then there was a kind of stronger, even punchier, absolute version. And then I think maybe a year or two after that, we got a sort of gardenia-inflected version, which, which brought out the gardenia. And the original was always a little bit gardenia-heavy. Gardenia itself now feels like an old-fashioned floral, but it, it, it was so good because you get florals, but you can't really pick them out. And I think as an attempt to present an abstract floral bouquet in a modern way, 
it was so good. It, it, I smell this now, and it doesn't feel retro or vintage or dated in any way. So there must have been lots and lots of materials that he decided he couldn't use. Uh, lots of those sort of, you know, olfactory ticks from the past. But what he's given us is something that's characteristically open, translucent, full of light, very, very optimistic. Um, so maybe this is wisdom as well, or maybe this would be another mindfulness one. Um, Angeline says, I like Jure the original. It's nice while still being complex, yet still soft and interesting without disturbing colleagues. Yes, he, he, he managed all of that, didn't he? And I suppose, you know, I'm singing its praises now, but even I, I guess, didn't realize its importance at the time because I can't remember if I put it on my list of the top 10 for that particular year. I genuinely can't remember. I should go back and actually see what I put on my list of the top 10 for 2013. But now looking back, you realize why it was important because in many ways, it was the sort of last of the mainstream abstract florals. Chanel tried to do something like that, I guess, with Gabrielle, but that was less abstract because the, the, the tuberose came out there. Um, Hermès tried to do it again, I suppose, with Tutti, but again, that's a bit less abstract because that was a sort of tuberosey scent. Um, you, you, you can't really pin down a particular floral in Jour. Rachel says, uh, really appreciate your take on Jour. It is a modern abstract floral. Bravo. It, it is, isn't it? And, and it, it does it without being excessively aldehydic. It does it without being excessively woody in the base. Um, and Kevin says, Jour d'Hermès was almost like floral vinaigrette to me. Oh, I'm going to, mind you, that is not a bad thing, okay? A floral vinaigrette is not a bad thing. I so notice you haven't told me what you do, Gavin. Not that you have to. You're some kind of copywriter or somebody. <laughs> um, I, I really, really like it. And, and I'm very, very glad that I've got this bottle in my collection. And speaking of florals, but speaking of florals that actually do not mind being retro or vintage or being a sort of homage to the past, the number 10 position on this list is taken up by Puentes. Iris Du, one of my favourites from last year, composed by Elian Puente. Watch this space. Uh, hopefully we will be doing an interview with him on this channel very, very soon. And when I say soon, I mean literally within the next few days. So stay tuned to social media for information about that date coming your way. And this is, this is a really, really beautifully done iris. Um, I will have to rearrange these a little bit better later for the for the photo opportunity and there needs to be room for the two special guests as well um i still have to smell this one says oris you really really you really do um it's just see what he has done here and clearly i'm going to ask him about this and you know not not a very difficult question to to, to predict from me is how do you make a scent that feels like a homage to retro vintage sense without without a kind of pastiche, without a cliche, without completely getting stuck in those sorts of traps, because this feels contemporary, and yet it also is such a loving, respectful nod to the past. And yet, is, yes, it is an iris, but it's also not a cold, melancholy, funereal iris. It's, it's a kind of spring iris. Uh, irises tend to be summer flowers, don't they? So, but if you can imagine a, a spring iris, this is an iris that is full of optimism. This one I'm going to sort of say effort as well, because it kind of makes you get up and, and face the new season. Um, really, really beautiful, really, really nicely done. So, uh, oh, and what is the new one virescence like though, says Natasha? Well, I will give you a kind of a thumb review right now because we, we, we need to do it in a video, but the thumb review, for virescence goes like this. So if you can get your hands on a sample, try and get it. Right, so special guests. One of them is a special guest because it is from a brand that regular viewers will know. Hang on, this is gonna be a bit noisy. Regular viewers will know I don't review and I don't put it to top 10 lists, but I'm going to, every now and then I allow myself to mention them. So because this perfume just so sums up the concept of the power of nature, I thought I've got to include it. This is from, from, from 2009, but I haven't been able to find out who the perfumer is. So if 
maybe one day, if you know who is watching, perhaps you could tell us who the perfumer is. This is, of course, from Amouage. It is their amazing, masterful Ubar, the perfume that kind of completely makes the earth shake each time you spray any of it. Um, let us let us release a few drops of Ubar from this spot. Oh, Rachel is going Ubar with how many exclamation marks is that? Not nearly enough. Um, this 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 is stuff that you unleash, isn't it? Let's pop these ones on here for now. And if you think this one is special, wait and see what the next um, special guest is going to be. Such an underrated gem, says Rachel. Is Uber underrated though? I mean, who? I mean, okay, I agree. You couldn't overrate it, but who underrates it? I've only ever seen it being praised to the high heavens. Wasn't it Bernard Elena, says Air Bureau? I don't know. It could have been. It could have been. We, I will try to find out. Maybe what I will do is I will, at some point over the next few days, um, I will try to find out. Um, <sighs> Sorry, I've just gone completely quiet because I keep smelling this. This is um this is a huge, huge, humongous floral. It's almost like sort of saying everything that is most powerful about the florals in nature, let us try putting them together, but let us also try to make them coherent and also abstract. I believe it's discontinued, says S. Omar. It may well be, but for these two special guests, I thought, okay, because the other one that is the special guest you can't get anyway, officially, you have to get it from, you know, um, secondary sellers. Um, it, it's, it's just so hard to describe. This definitely has a bit of hyacinth, although it is not a hyacinth perfume. It is just like you have been, you know, like some kind of... Um, teleportation device has sucked you into the most opulent, the most intoxicating garden in the galaxy. You know, look up the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and sort of see where this, where this place might be. And then, and you are surrounded by flowers that not only smell incredible, but also have the most amazing kind of laser-like hypnotic colors. Um, it is just extraordinary, but it also, it, it somehow manages to be as masculine as it is feminine, as woody as it is floral, as intimate as it is huge. Um, it, it is nature at its, at its, at its most powerful. Ah, um, oh, Esumar says, Lucas Turin described Ubar as a Godzilla floral, I believe. Okay, but ex without the negative connotations of the Godzilla, um, I think it's something that is much more uh, creative than destructive, if you see what I mean. And finally, 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 <clears throat> uh, this one is one that I told you I uh, a few weeks ago that uh, I got on, on the internet. It was Madame Perselais herself who bemoaned the fact that she doesn't have any uh, really, really grand, old-fashioned style and yet wearable today abstract florals in her collection. And I thought, ooh, I need to see if I can get her a bottle of vintage YSL Yves Saint Laurent Paris. And um, and it arrived. And, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because it is actually the subject of the review that I posted on my Substack today. So if you would like to kind of get extended thoughts on it, very, very extended thoughts, nearly thousand words worth of extended thoughts, then please go to my Substack. Um, but I did want to smell it in front of you, with you, because I said I would. I think I promised that I would. Here it is. So this is the version that would now be sold as an EDP, as an eau de parfum. But back in the day, before the term eau de parfum had been standardized amongst the brands, and different brands used different things, um, YSL used the term fleur de parfum. So a lot of you will know Christian Dior did Esprit de parfum. What was Garlin? Garlin's, I think, was parfum de toilette. It was Chanel, I believe, who coined Eau de Parfum, and then that was the one that stuck. Um, th th this, 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 this stuff is so good. And, and, I, and I have said to Madame Perselais that she must feel free to wear it as much as she likes, but to please, 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 I have begged her to 
not finish the bottle, but when she kind of gets towards the end to um, to just leave me a few drops for reference. I'm just going to do one spray. This stuff is so crazily diffusive. Um, it is one of the most perfect roses ever made. Um, oh, God. Ah. just takes you back straight away, doesn't it? I, I don't know the technicalities of why uh, it can't be made in this form anymore, because current YSL Paris is really, really, really a shadow of its former self. It is so sad. And I think it's it's in terms of its sillage and also in terms of its tenacity, its long-lastingness. You get, you get a kind of initial hit of what you feel is familiar Paris at the beginning, but then it it just it just kind of goes off and it becomes very very thin and weak. Um, it could be because of the, um, the the materials that we used a lot in the eighties to create um, rosy notes, violety notes, so ionones, etc. Maybe maybe they're not used so much anymore because they do come across as a bit old fashioned. Maybe they're not used in it so much anymore because you're not allowed to use them. Whatever the reasons, um, it's just it is just so giving and kind-hearted and generous and warm a perfume. I think in that sense, it is probably the most generous that Sophia Groisman ever created. And she she did some amazing pieces of work. I mean, she did white linen for Estee Lauder, beautiful for, for Estee Lauder, uh, Trezor for Lancome, um, Eternity for Calvin Klein, so many others. We talked about Calix for prescriptives. Um, I could just, I, I, you know, when when this bottle arrived, uh, when I was, you know, doing the the day job thing and sitting at my desk and answering emails and doing, I just sprayed some on some paper and I just left it by my side and it just filled the the, the air with this with this radiant, beautiful, heavenly gorgeousness and then filled my mind with all of the most heavenly thoughts. So th this, I think, I, th I think it is has got to be wisdom as well because it is. I think its wisdom comes across in the fact that it is just so generous and kind. And even though it's huge and has got this unbelievable sillage and diffusiveness, it never feels overbearing or overwhelming. Um, ah, I, I just think, I think it is extraordinary, really, really beautiful. And I'm going to keep this bottle, this blotter rather, for, for days and days and days and just keep smelling it. So we are done. Thank you very much for tuning in. That is the top 10 for spring 2024. Thank you very much for all the comments. Um, even if you're watching the recording, so if you haven't been able to make it to the live, please let me know what you're most looking forward to wearing for this spring and leave any questions or comments that you would like to. Um, but I will say thank you and goodbye for now and stay tuned to social media for details of more videos coming your way. Until then, may it be a peaceful, happy, and above all, healthy spring for every single one of you. Bye now.